spoiler and content warning for A Silent Voice. I will be talking about major spoilers for the series, so if you haven't read or watched it for yourself and want to avoid spoilers, then I suggest you click off this video and save it for a later date. Also, I will be getting into heavy topics like bullying and self-harm, and if you're sensitive to that stuff, then I suggest you click off this video. You have been warned. One of my favorite genres of manga is Slice of Life. For me, A Slice of Life is about connections between the characters and the story, or between the reader and the characters. And I recently read a series that I think emphasizes the human connection within its story. That series is A Silent Voice by Yoshitoki Oima. Apologies for butchering the name. A Silent Voice was originally published as a one-shot by Kodansha, and was later serialized by Weekly Shonen Jump from August 2013 until November 2014. The series was nominated for many awards, including an Eisner Award here in the West, and it actually won two awards in Japan, one for Best Rookie Manga and the other for New Creators. The series would go on to receive an anime movie adaptation released in 2016, which was critically and commercially acclaimed. I hadn't seen the movie before I picked up the manga. I had seen snippets used in AMVs, but I never sat down to watch the full thing. I decided to go with the manga instead since it's my preferred media, and I could also see the creator's original vision for the series. So here's a quick rundown of each volume, with my thoughts interwoven. The first volume introduces us to our two main characters, Shoya and Shoko. Shoya is shown as a daredevil who also bullies people for the sake of making friends. Shoko is a deaf girl who transferred schools after getting bullied at her previous school. Unfortunately, the bullying continues by Shoya and his classmates, as well as the school administrator. After being bullied for weeks with no end in sight, Shoko is forced to transfer schools yet again, and the class as well as the teacher paint Shoya as the sole reason for her departure, even though they are just as guilty. The bully then becomes the victim. Shoya's friends turn on him and he's treated like a menace by the rest of the class and the teacher. We then flash forward six years later. Shoya is now a high school loner who is still treated poorly by the people he used to call friends. We see him quit his job, cancel his phone contract, sell all of his belongings, and leave the money in an envelope. He then tracks Shoko down to her new high school, and that's where the first volume ends. This volume didn't sell me on the series at first. Looking back after finishing the series, I can definitely appreciate the themes the book sets up, as well as the characters. I do enjoy the high school aspect of the series more than the elementary school setting, but I still appreciate everything this volume sets out to do. However, the second volume is where things really picked up for me personally. It starts out right where the previous book left off. Shoya explained that he tracked down Shoko to give her her communication book, she left behind in elementary school. He explains that he hates himself, and we as the reader will later find out that he planned to kill himself. He then lets his nerves get to him in the moment and asks if they could be friends, which Shoko accepts. He never truly apologized in this moment, and that's something this series will hold on to. The book shows Shoya and Shoko hanging out despite Shoko's mother's disapproval. We're also introduced to two new characters, Shoko's sister Yuzuru and Shoya's new friend Tomohiro. Yuzuru is shown as a tough kid character who will do anything to protect Shoko, and through some flashbacks, we learn that she was bullied for protecting her sister, even going so far as to have rocks thrown at her. Because of this protective nature, she initially gives Shoya the cold shoulder, but after witnessing his actions when Shoko goes missing, she learns that his intentions are pure and begins to trust him. Then there's Tomohiro, one of Shoya's classmates. Shoya helped him when a bully tried to steal his bike. Since then, Tomohiro hasn't left Shoya's side and he's shown to be Shoya's first real friend since middle school. This volume really hooked me. The new characters make for some interesting additions, like giving more context to Shoko's family and her upbringing, and Shoya questioning what are friends since meeting Tomohiro. But the main point of interest for me personally is showing that mental scars never truly disappear. Like Shoko's mom says to Shoya, no matter what he does now, he can't erase the pain he caused her. No matter how much she tries, the mental scars of the torment he caused will never leave Shoko. It's an interesting theme to explore, and one that I think is important for the series to tackle since bullying and mental health are big issues that the series tries to explore. The third volume continues some of the stuff we saw in the previous volume, like Shoya and Shoko hanging out at a bridge where they feed fish. This volume also reintroduces two characters, Miyoko and Nyoka. Both characters were introduced in the first volume as elementary school classmates with Shoya and Shoko. Miyoko is a kind-hearted character, and was Shoko's only real friend in elementary school. Unfortunately, she was bullied for being Shoko's friend, and eventually stopped attending that school. 
In the years after, she would feel guilty for leaving Shoko behind, and with some help from Shoya, she would have the opportunity to make amends. She shows and explains that she learned sign language after leaving elementary school, and now joins the crew for their hangout sessions, like singing karaoke and feeding fish. Naoka, on the other hand, is a cold-hearted character. She was one of the students who bullied Shoko, and this resentment for her remains to this day. Naoka shows that she hasn't grown as a person, and only hangs out with the group to be near Shoya since she's had a crush on him since elementary school. She acts as a force that tries to pull Shoya back into his old ways, but as he proves throughout the latter half of the series, he really has changed as a person. I think it was a brilliant idea to reintroduce both of these characters in the same volume since they act as opposing forces. One is kind-hearted and genuine, while the other is cold-hearted and egotistical. This was another solid volume, even though the ending did give me the biggest psych moment I've had in my manga collecting journey. We never really see Shoya and Shoko get together by the end of the book, even though it is heavily teased. Volume 4 would continue the trend of reintroducing characters while also introducing a new one. A returning character is Miki. She is another character who used to bully Shoko, but has come to regret it in her high school years. Not because she's developed as a person, rather she just wants to impress a guy who hates bullies. That guy also happens to be our new character, Satoshi. A guy who aspires to be a teacher so he can watch his classmates' children grow up. Yeah, that sounds a bit crazy, but he's shown to be a nice guy in the majority of the scenes he's in. He just has a few screws loose. The group spends a good chunk of the volume hanging out at an amusement park, and at this moment, Shoya feels like he has actual friends. Things are going well, but Naoka has to cause him trouble and yells at Shoko in private, then proceeds to slap her after Shoko explains that she hates herself. And things only continue to go downhill when Shoko and Yuzuru's grandmother passes away a few days later. This deeply impacts both of them since their grandmother was a shoulder to cry on growing up. Their father left after finding out about Shoko's disability, leaving their mom to be a single parent, which explains her cold nature towards people. Their grandmother took care of them while their mom worked to provide for the family, so the impact of her death is visible not only to the reader, but to Shoya as well. And thanks to Shoya and the rest of the group, the grieving process is made a bit easier. Then the volume ends with Yuzuru promising to help Shoko communicate her feelings more clearly towards Shoya. The fifth volume is arguably the most important in the series. A majority of the volume is spent by the group working on their own movie, writing the script, getting extras, and trying to get permission to film at Shoya's old middle school. But when Satoshi joins Shoya to get permission, and they run into his old middle school teacher, his insecurities begin to boil over. This eventually leads to the group arguing at the bridge and splitting up. Things remain awkward between Shoya and Shoko as they continue to hang out, but Shoko blames herself for the group splitting up, even though it's really Shoya's fault for continuing to run from his past rather than confront it. They then go to a festival with Yuzuru and Shoko's mother to watch fireworks and eat good food. After some time passes, Shoko decides to head home early and leaves the group. Shortly after, Yuzuru sends Shoya to get her camera from their apartment so she can take photos. But when he arrives, he's met with a sight that would send anyone into shock. Shoko is standing on the ledge of the apartment balcony. He runs to catch her as soon as she steps over the edge. And spoiler for the next volume, he manages to catch her. I said that this is the most important volume because it shows that Shoya has grown in some aspects, but refuses to grow in other ways. Yes, he's now friends with Shoko and does his best to make her smile, but he keeps running from his past. He doesn't want Satoshi to find out what happened in middle school to prevent a friendship from potentially being over. He has yet to truly apologize to Shoko, and he has yet to truly open up to people, maintaining his distance to prevent himself from being hurt again. But Volume 6 will begin to unravel this, and we'll see Shoyo fully grow into the person he's striving to be. Volume 6 jumps straight into the action, with Shoyo managing to pull Shoko up to the ledge, but he falls over into the river below. Emergency responders manage to save Shoya, but he's in a coma-like state at the hospital. Luckily for Shoko, she only injured her right arm. We then see how the other characters respond to Shoya's actions. Shoya's actions prove to the others that he has changed from the person he used to be, and this inspires some characters to change as well, except for Naoka. She's still a witch. 
and she does get a taste of her own medicine thanks to Shoko's mom. So the group, minus Naoka, decides to continue work on their movie to surprise Shoyo when he wakes up. And the last two chapters would end up being some of my favorite moments in the series. In those two chapters, we get to see things from Shoka's perspective. Words are cut halfway, making it so the reader has to figure out what people are saying, just like Shoko has to do every day. We see her experience a middle school from her perspective, and when she lays down in bed, we get a transition to her current broken self. We get a flashback to the scene where Shoya tracked her down and explained that he plans to die. And we see the shock on her face when she hears the line, even without me, you'll be just fine. Someone feels the way she feels. She thinks that her family will be fine without her. But after hearing those words from Shoya and spending some time with them, she knows what the other person is feeling in that scenario. With her emotions swelling and her heart pounding, she rushes to the bridge where they usually meet, and once she's there, she collapses to her knees and lets out a scream with tears running down her cheeks. We then transition to the hospital, where a comatose Shoyo regains consciousness. Volume 7 picks up right where Volume 6 left off. Shoya, in a sleepy state, rips off the medical equipment attached to him and heads to the bridge. Once there, both characters look at each other, wondering if they're hallucinating. But Shoko pokes Shoya, confirming they're both real. And in that moment, Shoya truly apologizes rather than beating around the bush like he usually does. After getting checked up at the hospital, Shoya is cleared to leave, and we see the Nishimiyas and Ishidas have some bonding time, with both moms getting very drunk. The friend group reunites at the school festival to watch the film they made. It didn't receive glowing views, but Shoya loved it. Afterwards, the group wanders around, and in this moment, Shoya finally lets his guard down, accepting his feelings, whether they are good or bad. He's no longer alone. We flash forward to their high school graduation. We hear the plans that each character has for their future, with the group eventually splitting up. Shoya and Shoka go to the room where their old middle school classmates are having a reunion. They're both scared to go in at first, but after talking, they both enter the room hand in hand. A Silent Voice is truly a story about human connection. Bullying, loneliness, self-hatred, the desire for companionship, and many other things are part of being human. And the series manages to handle these topics and many others with a delicate hand, resulting in a story that has impacted many readers. If you've watched this video and you haven't read A Silent Voice, then please do yourself a favor and check out this series for yourself. Even if you're no longer in high school, I'm sure you'll find some moments that deeply resonate with you. After all, all humans strive for some level of connection. If you made it this far into the video, I want to thank you so much for watching. I originally scripted this video back in March, but I wasn't entirely happy with the end product. Months later, I feel like it's in a state that I'm content with. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on A Silent Voice, whether it's the manga or the anime. Who is your favorite character in the series? I'm personally a Shoko guy. And if you're new to the channel, then consider subscribing. I make manga essay videos, hauls, and more. And if you're into comics like Marvel and DC, I cover those too on occasion. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in my next video. Goodbye.